Well, I've titled today's and today's lesson and maybe the title of the course of queries and evidences. And I wanna introduce that in case some of you are wondering really what's going on here. And frankly, this is something I've been thinking about for years. And so I've wanted to write for myself uh, essentially uh, what the outline of this course will be. And I might put that in my own writing and you know, give it to family or whatever, I don't know. But uh, I've been thinking in these latter days um, in the information age that we're in and the particular uh, blessings that we receive uh, living in the last days and also the challenges um, that something like this might be useful. Uh, and I'm gonna, I normally don't read notes, as you know, very much, uh, I'll, I'll refer to them, but I might stay closer to my outline today than I normally do. Um, as Jane said, if you don't have notes, just get, make sure I have your email on this yellow notepad and I'll shoot those off every Thursday morning. Um, but Gordon B. Hinckley says this, I do not fear truth, I welcome it, but I wish to have all facts in their proper context. Uh, and so why such a class? Well, this will be a course or a class to evaluate questions for those who question. This will be a course to provide evidences uh, to those questions uh, and that correspond to the questions of faith. Many who leave their faith do so because they have questions they can't intellectually resolve. Unanswered questions can create cognitive dissonance and sometimes lead to an abandonment of spiritual truths that they formerly knew. Uh, again, I think we've seen that in the last 15 years of our church history uh, more dramatically perhaps than uh, the previous hundred before that. Some disregard more faithful questions and evidences because they've accepted a working framework based on social or political views that dismiss the spiritual evidences before them as contrived, trivial, or overstated. So to the critic or cynic in matters of faith, specifically in matters of the restored gospel, restored through the prophet Joseph Smith, uh, you have questions and I have questions, fair enough. Let's now put you on the witness stand and ask you some questions and present you the evidences related to the restoration of the gospel in these, the latter days. Oftentimes as Latter-day Saints, we feel ourselves on our heels. Sometimes even being felt like we are put in a position where we have to answer all these questions of the critic. Uh, and and, and it's, it, question asking is fair and fine and welcome. Uh, but what I hope to do over the course of the next eight weeks is maybe to flip the script a little bit. And let's put the doubter on the stand, on the witness stand. Let's put the critic on the witness stand and let's ask you a few questions that are not easily or summarily dismissed about the evidences that the Lord has abundantly revealed in the latter days. And let's have you answer those questions. And uh, that's what I hope we can do. And we'll take a subtopic every week. Next week, I thought we'd do it today, but there was, I just wanted to do a proper introduction. Next week, we'll start with the Book of Mormon. All right? We'll talk about evidences of the divinity of the Book of Mormon. Then we'll go on, and I, uh, I won't do this completely accurate, just ad lib, but we'll, we'll do miracles. We'll do prophecies. We'll do the witnesses of the presiding authorities and prophets of the church and their experiences. We'll do the collective witness of the body of the saints. And we'll just go week by week and we'll ask questions. And I hope that you can help me um, ask even more questions. If I had this in my mind's eye, I could see a little book, frankly, that addressed each one of these topics. And at the end, there was just 20 questions that we don't even answer. We just pose them. And I hope that you can help me fill in some of those, those questions. So, uh, so that's where we're going. Uh, and I, I, I do that because uh, it ought to be said that we should be seeking and asking. We, and, and there is a great deal that we do not understand. And yet the Lord does not leave us 
without the faculty or the means or the evidence to support us along our witness of faith. And so uh, that's what I'm hoping to do. Now I say here, two friends, let me tell you some stories real quick. Two of my friends. One, I was serving as uh, the bishop in Chinatown, as Jane had mentioned, in New York City. And we had a man and his wife who came down to serve in Chinatown from the Upper West Side Ward in Manhattan. And um, great people, good friends. Um, he was attending law school at Cornell University. And uh, he was coming down because he could no longer tolerate attending church up with uh, everybody else with, you know, up on the Upper West Side. He wanted to kind of get away into a little bit of a foreign environment. This was part of his eventual exit from the church. He and I would sit down and talk a lot about some of the issues that he had, um, intellectual, historical uh, issues uh, with the church and whatnot. And he said to me, uh, well, I asked him first, I said, talk to me about your spiritual experiences that you've had. You served a mission? Yes. Talk to me about that. Did you feel the Holy Ghost in your testimony as you bore witness? Yes. Did you have the type of experiences that you knew the Lord was guiding you? Yes. We went through these, the series of questions like this. Um, and I said, well, what do you do with that evidence? And I think that time and distance had numbed the effects of that experience in his life. And he said to me, he said, look, Matt, uh, it's as if now, and he, remember he's a law student at Cornell University. He says, it's as if I am in a courtroom and I now have more evidence than I didn't have when I had those experiences in the first place. I've got more information. Therefore, I must throw out my pre previous witness. Uh, I challenged him on that. And I said, actually, the experience that you had was genuine, no matter what comes after. And the most accurate interpretation of your experience is in the moment that you had it. That was the most genuine point. To reinterpret it now 15 years later is a little disingenuous. Do you know that there was a, there's a study that's been done for those who were in lower Manhattan on 9-11. And they recorded their feelings and experiences right after the Twin Towers went down and they witnessed it. And they provided the details of their own personal account. I was there too. Uh, and then they have taken those same testimonies and 10 years later and 20 years later, They've asked them to reproduce their own witness from the events of that day. And what do you suppose happens, brothers and sisters? It changes dramatically. The, the facts and the figures and the specifics of that memory recall is dilutive over time. Uh, and so this is the same issue that I'm talking to my friend about. Uh, discounting his previous spiritual experiences um, because he has some new supposed information that maybe God wasn't aware of when he gave him the spiritual experience in the first place. Well, secondly, uh, I have a, another very good friend. Both these men I love today as I did, you know, when we were younger friends and uh, still have tremendous respect for them. This is another friend who I was very close with uh, and am very close with. Uh, who had leadership positions and a mar has a marvelous family. And, but for whatever reason, he came across something called the CES letter. Perhaps you've heard of it, uh, which was a letter of a critic of the church who enumerated over many pages all sorts of questions that supposedly nobody could answer. And this got a hold of my friend. Uh, and he uh, eventually left the church and took his seven kids with him. Um, he and I have also had multiple meetings, sort of post-fact, to talk about this. Uh, and I've asked him some of the questions that I'm going to ask you over the course of the next eight weeks uh, about the evidences of the Book of Mormon and so on and so forth. And he's honest with me and says, Matt, I can't answer those questions. 
And so my response to him and to you is, let's look in total. And I will be approaching this from sort of the, the prosecutor against the case <laughs> that the church has all these uh, questions that are unanswerable, and therefore we ought not have faith. Of course, I believe the exact opposite, that the Lord has given a tremendous amount. And we'll ask those questions. And so those are two stories that I think perhaps frame uh, what I hope we accomplish over the next uh, couple of months. Now, laying a foundation. So today, instead of getting right into some of those questions, I want to uh, look at some of what I'm calling the key uh, epistemological principles. Epistemology is the study of how we know what we know. It's, it's how, you, uh, how we analyze what we know and how we came to know it. And so there's just a handful of principles, I think, that I'd like to discuss with you today. Uh, and I'll write some of these down uh, as we go through them. So the first principle that I'd like to discuss, as advanced as we are as a human species, and as for as much knowledge as we have collectively accumulated, there is yet an almost infinite distance between our understandings and the knowledge of God, an omniscient being. I don't know if anyone would argue with that. It's as if we were to say that I have an IQ. What, what, what's my IQ? I have no idea. Um, let's say it's 120, all right? And what's a really good IQ? 160? What's that? Let's say there's somebody over here that's got an IQ of 160. And that's a, there, there might be a great distance between those IQs there. I don't know, what's, what's Albert Einstein? Do you get up to 180? Okay. And so we kind of split hairs and we talk about Ivy League degrees and we talk about scholarly books and we have intellectual debates that all happen within the range of that high human IQ distribution curve, all right? We're going to put the mass of population somewhere within that distribution curve. And so you might have somebody in the 95% confidence band, statistically speaking, that is really far advanced on the IQ spectrum. And you'll have those who may have mental disabilities or cognitive disabilities or that might be on the other end of that bell curve, right? Uh, the point I want to dramatize by the principle here is that this curve is so irrelevant when you compare it to the distance of our knowledge and intelligence compared to God. If this curve is here, the range goes here and loops around and loops around and loops around and loops around to infinity. Uh, and, and therefore, what, what's the implication of that? Of course, we're to do all that we can within the confines of our own intellectual expression and trying to, to, to grapple with these ideas with every you know, capacity that we have. But in reality, when we compare our intellectual faculties to our Father in heaven, it doesn't even begin to compare. Uh, and and what, is it, what's the what, what does that suggest? What conclusions do you draw from that? Any thoughts? Yes. Like compared to God, we're like an embryo. Yeah, I think that's right. And, and so what, is that, what does that mean? Yeah. You want to tap into what he has. Um, you want to interpret the way things that, that, that he does. He, may, he sees a broader perspective, Trish. Yeah. Is IQ the um, requirement for exaltation? That's a good thing. A lot of us might be in trouble, right? Well, I, I wanted to, this is sort of, I, I cut and paste this in the notes, uh, and I'm just going to read this little blurt to you because uh, 
I think it's interesting. This deals with entanglement theory in quantum physics, all right? Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. But today, quantum entanglement is, is poised to revolutionize technology from computers to crypto, cryptography. Physicists have gradually become convinced that a phenomenon, two subatomic particles that mirror changes in each other instantaneously over any distance is real. Uh, let me break this down. I, I'm not a scientist, but I can watch Nova like the rest of you, um, the PBS special. And uh, I watched this and it talked about a, it, it was a, a series that was focusing on a debate that was had in the early 1900s uh, between Niels Bohr from Denmark, a brilliant physicist who, physicist who went on to win the Nobel Prize, and Albert Einstein. And uh, you know, Albert Einstein, of course, looked at the theory of relativity, and he looked at how these laws operate throughout space and time that extend throughout the universe and, dev and devised a, you know, I'm looking at Gail Billings, he could come up here and give a real lesson on this. He was a rocket scientist. but devised a, a, a ser series and a theorem that, uh, of laws and mathematics that describe how we believe the universe operates. And then if you go from big down to small, we'll call that quantum physics, where you see how the subatomic particles interact with each other and how they're constructed. And the debate here between these brilliant men who are really far out on that distribution curve on the IQ uh, chain that I drew up there, uh, had something to do with the fact that particles were linked to each other and that two particles uh, were ethereal until they were observed or measured. And when they were observed or measured, they would present in a predictable fashion at the exact same time every single time. And that space and time and distance did not constrain that, that revelation or that measurement. So if you, let me dramatize this. If you were to take uh, two dice and you rolled them every single time, any combination would add up to seven. And it would happen a million out of a million times. And it would happen universes away from the same subatomic particles. Now I'm sure I haven't described that uh, perfectly, but the implications of that theory challenge a lot of Einsteinian physics. Uh, and so you have scientists today who are working on this and they actually set up these big telescopes in the Canary Islands and they take light from quasars, which are star systems, billions of light years away and that they're independent from each other. And they experimented on this. Uh, and the, they appear that the, the Niels Bohr's theory of entanglement uh, works and it works mathematically. Uh, now, I'm not here to talk about physics, but what I am here to, to say is that there's a great deal about how this universe works that the most brilliant minds on earth are really grappling with and they're only at the very, very beginning. And, and so with that little bit of humility, uh, I think we ought to read, I'm going to read to you some passages from Job 38. I'm reading from the New Living Version because it kind of strikes the tone, maybe a little better than the King James does in this instance. But here's, here's what Job asks. Actually, it's the Lord speaking to Job. Who is this that questions my wisdom with such ignorant words? Brace yourself like a man, because I have some questions for you, and you must answer them. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you know so much. Who determined its dimensions and stretched out the surveying line? What supports its foundations, and who laid its cornerstone? as the morning stars sang together and all the angels shouted for joy. Who kept the sea inside its boundaries as it burst from the womb? And as I clothed it with clouds and wrapped it in thick darkness, for I locked it behind barred gates, limiting its shores. I said, this far and no farther, 
farther will you come? Here your proud waves must stop. Have you ever commanded the morning star to appear and caused the dawn to rise in the east? Have you made daylight spread to the ends of the earth to bring an end to the night's wickedness as the light approaches to the earth takes shape like clay pressed beneath a seal? It is robed in brilliant colors. Have you explored the springs from which the seas come? Have you explored their depths? Do you realize the extent of the earth? Tell me about it if you know. Where does light come from? And where goeth, does darkness go? Can you take each to its home? Do you know how to get there? But of course you know all this. I think this is a sarcastic response by the Lord, by the way. <laughs> But of course you know all this, for you were born before it was created, and you are also very experienced. Can you direct the movements of the stars, binding the cluster of the Pleiades, or loosening the cords of Orion? Can you direct the constellations through the seasons, or guide the bear with her cubs across the heavens? Do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? I mean, stop right there. We, we're arguing over Einstein and Bohr's debate about the laws of the universe, quantum physics. It's one thing to argue about them. How about to construct them in such a manner that this universe exists and operates and functions and interacts with it the way that we do? That's a whole nother ball game. Can you shout to the clouds and make it rain? Can you make lightning appear and cause it to strike you as direct? Who gives intuition to the heart and instinct to the mind? Who provides food for the ravens when their young cry out to God and wander about in hunger? Isn't that a beautiful passage in Job? Very thought-provoking, and, and, and it's sort of the Lord putting those who would uh, dismiss his marvels in their place. Well, one of the principles then is this distance between us and God and his intelligence. We'll just say the distance between our mind and God's. And then secondly, we would say that because of that reality, there are and there will be questions that we don't have answers to yet. Uh, you're familiar with this verse. From Isaiah, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. There's a difference between the way God sees things and the way we see things. And our obligation is to try and align ourselves with his will and with his thought. And we can do that in some limited fashion. And we do that according to his spiritual laws by harnessing, accessing the devices and the tools that he has ordained to bring us into his knowledge and light. And those are things like the Holy Ghost and the light of Christ and revelation and faith and agency and so on and so forth. Those are the tools of spiritual discovery, right? Yes. That type of uh, talk affect your two friends? You, you know what? Talk very often does not influence my friends. Experience does. And that's because of the way the Lord designs this, you see. That's, that's his learning ground is to... Ha or have something occur in your heart where you feel 
and your spirit recognizes it. I have had many, 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 many discussions over the years with uh, many people who have had this or that issue with their faith. Um, and I have found that talking, while can be helpful to increase understanding between each other, doesn't often, unless there's an abundant amount of humility, lead to any particular action that might change the course they're on. What's that? I can't hear you. Pain. Pain. Pain can change. You say, yeah. My, and why? What's the cor correlation between pain and the softening of the heart? We're going to get to another principle here that talks about humility being a prerequisite for learning and faith. Yes, in the back. I do think it's one of degree because you are... You have the DNA of God in your composition. You literally are his offspring, as Paul says. Uh, and what he is, you can become. So it is an issue of degree. Uh, it's an issue of time and progress. And I think your, your question maybe leads me to Joseph Smith's quote here. Let me read it to you. Joseph Smith taught, when you climb up a ladder, you must begin at the bottom and ascend step by step until you arrive at the top. And so it is with the principles of the gospel. You must begin with the first and go on until you learn all the principles of exaltation. But it will be a great while after you have passed through the veil before you will have learned them. It is not all to be comprehended in this world. It will be a great work to learn our salvation and exaltation even beyond the grave. There's much ahead. It's a great deal ahead. Yeah, Meredith. Yeah. Well, you, you, you pose the, you, you use the word limitations. And certainly we're full of them, and we will be. Uh, and when you talk about God, he will not discover some new truth that overthrows the need for a savior. He will not learn some new thing that uh, does away with the need for the plan of salvation. Uh, he's omniscient. He knows all things. But experientially, he progresses through his children and through their experience. That's what the 138th section, 32nd section talks about, how he progresses in dominion and in might and in intelligence is through the experiences. By the way, there are his own experiences as well. But as his children are exalted. Uh, but I would propose that he's not going to learn some new law of physics. Uh, I personally don't believe that. Um, well, let's go on to the next principle here. In leaving your faith, it must be said that you are automatically replacing some unanswered questions with other questions. You won't be left questionless, right? For instance, if the atheist says there is no God, he has to ask the question, how am I here? Why am I here? What am I to do? He has a host of questions still to deal with, to grapple with. You don't dismiss yourself of these quandaries uh, simply because you align yourself with one particular theory or faith. Uh, there will be questions. Uh, the Lord asked it this way. You remember he gave the bread of life sermon and he fed many people. Uh, on the banks of the Galilee. Uh, and then when he presented hard doctrines, uh, many of them left. They couldn't handle it. It was too much. And so he says, 
will ye also go away to the apostles? Remember? And uh, I don't remember if it's Peter or John. I think it's Peter who says, Lord, to whom shall we go? If I were to leave you, I'd have a whole nother host of problems. I wouldn't have any answers to. Uh, and I think, that's, I think that's right. So in leaving faith, I'll just say it this way, leaving faith does not leave you Out questions. Um, here's another principle. Our learning will be, and we've said this in a roundabout way already, but our learning will be facilitated if we learn by faith. We have access to enough answers to keep us moving forward. Got a couple of scriptural passages on this, and let's just take a moment to analyze this a little bit. Go, go with me to 2 Timothy uh, in your New Testament. And we'll go to chapter 3. Because it speaks to our day. Know this also, Paul says, that in the last days, perilous times shall come, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemous, disobedient to parent, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce despisers of those that are good. Well, he, he kept going, Paul. He wasn't done. Traitors and heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. That's a first vision phrase uh, that comes from Isaiah. For of this sort, they are which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sins, even led away with divers lusts. Now, it's in the context of him describing the last days, the days that we live in, that this popular and well-known verse comes, verse 7 ever learning and never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. Perhaps that is one of the most apt descriptions of our day. In Paul's day, what kind of knowledge was even available to the average citizen? Very limited. Most women didn't read. Most men did not have a formal education. Uh, and today, we live in the information age. Information at your fingertips. How many of you have been playing with AI at all? Anyone? Katie, what are you learning over there? Yeah, we did. Yeah, we, 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 we've asked Josh Coates in our ward, second ward, who's a PhD, Cal Berkeley uh, kind of guy in information systems and technology to give a fireside on information, I'm sorry, on artificial intelligence. What it is, what are the implications, how it interplays with our, you know, with our knowledge and agency and all these sorts. So it's gonna be a fascinating sort of uh, experiment, but, uh, or, or fireside, I should say. Um, but I think that, that Timothy here really does describe our day, doesn't he? We live in this day where you can learn, you could learn endlessly, you could have access to information, and yet do we arrive at truth? Not unless you do it the Lord's way. Do you remember the 50th section of the Doctrine and Covenants that says, what were you ordained to do? You were called to go preach the gospel. And if you do it by the spirit of truth, or if you do not do it, sorry, if you do not do it by the spirit of truth, uh, and do it by some other way, quote, then it is not of God. So what the Lord is saying in the 50th section is you can teach the truth. And if you do it the wrong way, you don't do it with the right motivations. You don't do it with the right spirit. It is not of God. Uh, it tells you something about his rubric of divine communication it has to be godly. Um, Section 88, you're familiar with this verse. 
Verse 118, and as all have not faith, seek ye diligently to teach one another words of wisdom. Yea, seek ye out the best books, words of wisdom. Seek learning even by study and by faith. Now, I want to pose a question to you, brothers and sisters. How? How do we seek learning by faith? What does that mean? Let's make that less abstract. How do we seek learning? How do we study by faith? Who can connect those two principles for me? Yes. Um, it goes back to what you uh, about faith, what faith knowledge of God that he exists. The second is his character and attributes. And then the third is the source of life that we can seek and that study. That's a good, that, if you couldn't hear in the back, uh, the comment was, let's go back to the lectures on faith, where the Lord said to, really have real faith, you must first understand um, my character, my nature, and my attributes. Uh, and you must understand who I am. And you must understand that your will is in accordance with my will, that we're aligned. And as you do that, you can actually begin to exercise real faith. I think that's a uh, helpful comment. Thank you. What, 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 how else would you talk about this interplay? Yes. You know, my, my uncle t tells a story. Uh, I was in a class of his at BYU years ago, and he said, and he told a story about my dad and he. They were at BYU at the same time, and they had some class, I think it was statistics, I don't recall. And um, they were waiting in line together at the testing center, and my dad disappeared. And then he comes back. The line was a long one, apparently. And Joseph says, Mark, where'd you go? Oh, I went to pray. <laughs> I went to pray for a little help on this exam. Well, it turns out dad didn't do so well on the exam. He tried to exercise faith, but faith without works is dead. And in this instance, a little prayer wasn't going to save that exam, right? He had half the equation, right? Let's ask the Lord to help me here. But he also, the Lord expects that we Study. Yes, Mary. It's really interesting, Mary. It's like priming the pump. It's getting the mind uh, vivified, getting the light juice going. Uh, and then you have access to what other, whatever realm of study that President Ireland was working on. Yes. I think so. I think that's a good comment. Um, it's essentially saying that we all have prisms through which we can look. We all have lenses through which we interpret the world. And I remember being uh, an English major at BYU, and we had to study critical theory, which was how authors uh, would imbue their works with a certain framework or lens. It might be the Marxist frameworks, which dealt with everything that we experience is through economics and the motivating force of um, your need to subsist through providing for yourself and a family or whatnot. So it was that you had to interpret the work through that lens, or you could do it through a feminist viewpoint, or you could do it through a modern viewpoint, or you could, there are all these theories out there uh, through which we can interpret the world. 
Uh, and then that was expanded to disciplines of study. You know, should we interpret the world through the philosopher's eyes or through the poet's eyes? Or should we view it through the scientist's eyes or the mathematician's eyes? And I think what you're saying is to the extent that we can, we ought to access the infinite perspective of the Lord uh, and see the world through the revelations that he has prescribed and given us because it will inform all of these disciplines. They are not a spiritual. They are, the Lord has ordained all these disciplines. Uh, but there, if we can harness that perspective, I think we'll be better off. So those, there's two scriptures there for you in Timothy and DNC 88. Let's read something here from President Marion G. Romney. I believe in study. I believe that men learn much through study. I also believe, however, and know that learning by study is greatly accelerated by faith. All right, that's to your point, Mary. One more. President John Taylor said, we ought to foster education and intelligence of every kind, cultivate literary tastes, and men of literary and scientific talent should improve that talent. And all should magnify the gifts which God has given unto him, them. If there is anything good and praiseworthy in morals, religion, science, or anything calculated to exalt and ennoble man, we are after it. But with all our getting, we want to get understanding. And that understanding which flows from God. So that's, uh, those are helpful. Yeah, Maureen. If you're saying that faith is evidence, how do you know if mm. you have faith? It's, it's more than just believing that something's going to happen, isn't it? That's right. So if you were to look at Hebrews uh, and, and Alma 32 that talk about uh, faith being the evidence of things not seen, uh, Elder Bednar actually does a bit of that description. And he says it like this. He says, uh, faith is walking one step, but it's, it's a principle of action, first of all. It requires us to get up and do something, to express our agency, and to propel us forward. And we take one step at a time into the darkness, into an area where we are maybe unsure, we can't see. President uh, Boyd K. Packer talks about the flashlight in the dark, remember? And you'll go as far as the light beam will extend. But then you're going to take another step into the dark. And what Elder Bednar says is the evidence portion is the Lord's assurance. He assures you to go forward because you can look behind you and you can see where you've come. And you can see evidence the Lord hasn't let you fall off a cliff. And so we keep walking into that darkness. That's an expression of faith. So that those verses on faith do talk about our ability to to examine evidence. And I'm glad you bring this up, Maureen, because we're going to talk about evidence for the next eight weeks. The Lord gives us evidence. He does not leave us without evidence. There are other words for evidence. Signs, witnesses, miracles. These are evidences, right? And we're going to examine those evidences because the Lord gives us those to encourage our faith, to spur us on, uh, so, what else do we need to say? Here's another couple of quotes. I suppose you can, you can look at those. Um, they deal with the same principle uh, of faith being required in our gaining of intelligence. Let's go on to the next one then. Another principle that we ought to examine when we think about how we know what we know is an acknowledgement that we don't comprehend that all we don't comprehend should produce a feeling of humility, which is a prerequisite to faith. All right? So humility comes before faith. Let me just dramatize that for you for a minute. Open up your scriptures to Alma 32. which is probably the greatest single scriptural sermon that we have on the topic of faith in all the scriptures. Uh, 
And you look at this, and I'm going to do this quickly, but do you remember the context here? These are those who are being thrown out of the synagogues, among the Zormites, because of they don't dress and talk like the fancy people do, right? And they're poor, they're poor class of people. Now look at this, verse 6, it says their afflictions had truly humbled them. They were prepared to hear the word of the Lord. Verse 7, they were truly penitent. Verse 8, they were lowly in heart, all right? Verse 12 talks about that they must be humble, that they might learn wisdom. Bottom of that verse, they were brought to a lowliness of heart, for, the, for they were necessarily brought to be humble. Verse 13, humble shows up two more times. Verse 14, humble shows up two more times. Verse 15, humble shows up two more times. Verse 16, humble shows up two more times. Are we getting the picture here? All of that is preamble to verse 21. Now, as I said unto you concerning faith, faith is not to have a perfect knowledge of things. Therefore, if ye have faith, ye hope for things which are not seen, which are true. What's the relationship between humility and faith? Well, you can't have one without the other. And I think my, my point here is that we just acknowledge that we don't know everything. Ah, shucks, let's throw it all away. All those stories about Joseph Smith and the first vision and these silly gold plates. And let's just throw it all away because I learned something new. How about a little bit of humility to say, wait. I don't know everything and there's a lot more here. And the Lord will lead me along, you see. Um, well, an acknowledgement of our humility will open the doors to us gaining more faith, and therefore we can seek learning with greater faith. Uh, and we've talked about God's intelligence on that curve being further out than ours, um, but it even goes beyond that. Come with me uh, to Abraham in your Pearl of Great Price. to chapter three. This has got to be one of my most favorite chapters for a lot of reasons. Um, but let's pick up one concept here. In verse 19, beginning in 19. Abraham 3, verse 19. And the Lord said unto me, these two facts do exist, that there are, that there are two spirits, one being more intelligent than the other. There shall be more intelligent than they. Here's the phrase. I am the Lord thy God. I am more intelligent than they all. That's a statement that says the Lord God is more intelligent, not just than you or than me, but the collection of all of our intelligence. And he's greater than all of that. You can see that it continues. If you trace the language of that revelation, you see that intelligence is actually is the, uh, means souls or spirits. And so God excels not just you or I in intelligence, but if you were to add all of our intelligence on top of each other, his intelligence is greater than that. Intelligence meaning light and glory and knowledge and truth. The light of truth, the section 93 says, right? So knowing that, I... Let's have a little experiment. You see, we have not arrived at our wonderfully advanced position in society uh, on the back of one or two men or women. It's the discoveries that have happened across millions of people in laboratories and in classrooms uh, that have propelled civilization forward. You know, Gail, you built rockets, but you didn't do it by yourself. You had other brilliant men and women helping you. If we were just to lock the doors here and we were to, to we, we've got a lot of experience in this room. We have a lot of professions, legal and, and scientific and mathematic and you, you name it, arts and everything. And let's just take out my iPhone and let's smash it with a sledgehammer. And then let's see if we collectively with all of our experience and wisdom can of ourselves reproduce that iPhone? <laughs> to say nothing of the technology behind it, the ones and zeros 
and the satellites, and the, you, you see where I'm going. Uh, and then extend that beyond and say, all right, well, let's just, okay, we can't do that. Let's just see if we can create a common rose. Or let's just see if we can cause the tree to grow of our own creation and making. And pretty quickly, we're back to Job 38, right? We're back to that experience that even with all the collective knowledge in this room, uh, we still cannot begin to see what God sees. And so once again, it invites, I think, uh, humility and reliance upon the Lord. Um, let's take a look at, uh, I, I think we're saying the same thing with the next principle, which is pride dismisses the Holy Ghost as an aid in learning and leaves us ignorant of real truth. That's saying what we just said another way. Um, but there's a profound passage, I believe, in Alma chapter 12 that I want to read and review with you. I came across this a couple of years ago, and it stuck with me. So go to Alma chapter 12, and uh, we'll pick it up in verse 10. Now we'll do nine. Let's start in nine, better context. Now Alma began to expound these things, saying unto him, and this is Alma and Angela contending with Zeezrom. It is given unto many to know the mysteries of God. Nevertheless, they are laid under a strict command that they shall not impart only according to the portion of his word which he doth grant unto the children of men. According to what? The heed and diligence which they give unto him. And therefore, he that will harden his heart, what happens, brothers and sisters? The same receiveth the lesser portion of the word, and he that will not harden his heart, to him is given the greater portion of the word. Until, until is that uh, incremental, progressive, time-lapse word that shows something happening over time, right? Until it is given unto him, to know the mysteries of God until he know them in full. And they that will harden their hearts, to them is given the lesser portion of the word until, until they know nothing. Concerning his mysteries, and then they are taken captive down to hell, or down to the devil, and led by his will down to destruction. Now, this is what is meant by the chains of hell. Isn't that interesting, brothers and sisters? It's that principle of to those who heed and hearken, which are obedience words, the Lord gives more, and you will progress on that path until you receive a fullness which means you see as he sees. That's a function of heed, paying heed to the Lord's commandments and receiving the revelations that he gives you. And the opposite is also true that to he who rejects, that will be taken, that knowledge will be taken away until they quote, know nothing. It's divergent paths. Yeah, Max? Yes, I think it does. Joseph Smith says in the 131st section that no man can be saved in ignorance. We can apply that generally to say that we must gain light and intelligence and knowledge. In the context of that verse, that section, he was speaking about ignorant of who the Son of God is, specifically. In one sense... As Alma lays it out, perfect knowledge supplants faith. And that's what 131st section is suggesting. It is a little bit semantics, because in another sense, God has perfect faith and perfect knowledge. It's, it's how we're using those words. Um, but you see, you either are going this way or that way. And it's not a function of how you're studying. It's a function of what? Paying heed. Read it again. 
He that will not harden his heart. According to the heed and diligence which they give unto him. It's that concept we've talked about in this room before about uh, John chapter 3, which says, he that doeth truth cometh to the light. It's what we do that, that allows us to gain access to greater light and knowledge that push us forward. Now, it may not mean that all of a sudden you have a better vocabulary or that you have a better way of, uh, of expressing it or that you're a better debater. But guess what? You just know. And your spirit just knows. And the light and the truth, as we sang this morning, reflects upon your senses. And it just radiates. It just, as Joseph Smith says, it just tastes good. Pure doctrine tastes good. Right? Well, let's go another lesson here. I'm, I've stopped writing these principles on the board, so sorry. But you've got them in your notes here. Um, Perception versus reality, layers of understanding, truth on a continuum. Uh, one of the observations that we um, can identify is that light in the scriptures descends gradually. Obviously, you recognize that from the first vision, um, where the Lord appears to the boy, prophet Joseph Smith, and that the light descends gradually upon him. Um, well, I think there's a metaphor there. I think there's a principle there that there, 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 is, there is a continuum, there is a spectrum of knowledge. And it may be, brothers and sisters, that you see something on that spectrum with limited bands, and that portion is true because it's light and good and, and correct. But that if we are able to broaden that spectrum, let's say this is the spectrum of truth, you may see this, and that's true. But if we can somehow broaden that, lengthen our perspective, then we're just going to have more. We're going to have more intelligence to feed the initial prompting and impression. You see? And, and God has no limits. He sees the whole thing. There's this truth on a spectrum. Um, another way to say this is the example I cite in, the, in, the, in my notes. Uh, if you were to go back 2,000 years ago and get the person in Palestine with the best eyesight and say, count all the stars you can see. Go off into the Judean wilderness and count all the stars in the sky. By their own faculties, they would have come back with how many stars? About 2,500. They would have been able to see 2,500 stars. And that's because they're on only one hemisphere. So if you were to do both hemispheres, we've got 5,000 stars that you can observe in the sky. Are there 5,000 stars in the sky, brothers and sisters? Yes. There are 5,000 stars in the sky and more, right? And so we get to Galileo and the telescope, and he can look up, and he observes twice as many. Galileo says, hold on, everybody. There's a lot more than we thought. There are 10,000 stars in the sky. And was Galileo right? Yeah, he sure was. There are 10,000 stars in the sky. And more. You see how truth can be revealed on a spectrum or in degrees? You don't throw away the five and 10,000. Those are good. But as we get more, as, as we can see further, the outputs change. Now, we today, and I would suggest that even by today's standards, what we see in comparison to what is probably out there is a little bit like Galileo to the James Webb Telescope. Today, through the James Webb Telescope, we've gotten a little better than Galileo. And we can observe that there are about 400 billion stars in our galaxy in the Milky Way. 
And with the help of the James Webb Telescope, we can surmise that there are two trillion, have I done that right? Is that two trillion? Galaxies. Now, if you were just to say on average, every galaxy had 400 billion stars like we think ours has, where does that leave Galileo? He was right. There are 10,000 stars in the universe. Um, I love how this, this came from an Atlantic uh, news article. It just says, there are roughly a septillion stars in the observable universe. That's one with, I think, what is it, 24 zeros? 27? Which is, for the lack of a more fitting description, a lot of stars. <laughs> and, and that's where we're left. Um, so the principle here, once again, is that oftentimes, and you'll find this in the debates with your friends and loved ones over very um, prescient issues and current events, where you can both be identifying some portion of truth and you can put a check mark of it above it and say, yes. But if we're able somehow to guide ourselves, but with the assistance of the spirit, we might move the boundary a little bit and see more holistically with a greater perspective and not think so narrowly to the extent that we can, brothers and sisters. Um, that's a principle, layers of understanding. Um, well, I'll leave you to read Clayton Christensen's, um, it's, it's, it's good, good stuff on the importance of asking the right questions uh, to get to the right answers. Uh, I've done with you before something I really appreciate from Elder Larry Corbridge, it's in your notes about asking uh, the prime, getting answers to the primary questions. There are primary questions and there are secondary questions. And the primary questions, the Lord is very eager and willing to reveal. And the secondary questions, sometimes you'll search your whole life and never get an answer to. But that the Lord wants you to know the answers to the primary questions. And he puts them as these. Is there a God who is our Father? What Elder Corbridge is saying is it's not hard to get an answer to that question. Is Jesus Christ the Son of God, the Savior of the world? The Lord is willing to reveal that truth. Was Joseph Smith a prophet? The Lord is eager to reveal that truth because it reveals him. Is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints the kingdom of God on earth? Again, the Lord is eager to reveal that truth because it opens the door towards covenant making between God and man. Right? And what Elder Corbridge is saying is you can't go by the process of elimination and answer all the secondary questions out there to come to a conclusion that the primary truths are real. For instance, the secondary questions are unending. They include questions about church history, polygamy, people of African descent and the priesthood, women and the priesthood, how the Book of Mormon was translated, the Pearl of Great Price, DNA in the Book of Mormon, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Right? Now, we're going to spend the coming weeks talking about some of these issues, and that's just fine. But if we do so without the Spirit of the Lord, if we do so without His assistance and aid, we will be no better for the process. Uh, at the end of the day, brothers and sisters, we need to conclude today. We must put ourselves in a position by heeding the counsel and the commandments of the Lord to have our minds opened and available to his inspiration. Next week, we're going to talk about the Book of Mormon, and I'm going to say it a dozen times. All the evidences that I will point to will not give you a testimony of the book. It will be the Lord in his mercy through the power of his spirit that bears witness to your soul in a way that you cannot describe fully, that gives you the witness that you need. And that's real intelligence. That's real knowledge, right? And so with those, with those few principles, let's dig in. Let's go next week, and we'll start with the evidences of the restoration. And we'll do one topic per week. And I want to examine what has the Lord, Lord shown us 
What can we surmise? Where can we find his fingerprints all over this kingdom, this restoration, our prophets and apostles, and our personal experience? And it's my testimony, brothers and sisters, that the Lord's fingerprints are all over it, and that there's abundant evidence for us to examine. And if we will examine it and weigh it and seek his light and support to understand and comprehend it, we'll be all better for the event. And I say that and leave that with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.